Okay, now, jumping into the scripture this morning. How many of you have ever had a friend or an acquaintance in your life who, when you were sharing something significant in your life, something significant that had happened, something significant that you were going through, they were always able to one-up you or turn it about themselves or act like they're an authority giving you worthless advice. Any of you have any people in your life like that? If you don't, you are probably that person. <laughs> so so here, here's one example. Man, I am so bummed. The engine blew out on my car yesterday. And I, I don't know how I'm going to get it repaired. The other person. Yeah, I know just how you feel. I had my tire blow out last year. It was like 150 bucks. You know, I had to just put it on my credit card. Don't worry about it. I paid it off the following month. You just need to suck it up and be happy. Just be thankful a meteor didn't hit your house. Or how about this one? Man, I'm really distraught. I just found out that a family member has aggressive breast cancer. Them. Oh, man. I remember when I had a spot taken off my face. The doc said it could have potentially become cancerous. It was scary, but I just believe God and I'm good. You just need to believe God. Anybody relate to any of that? A little too close to home for some of you? Well, when we're looking at the Apostle Paul and what he's communicating to the church at, at Philippi, because they're going through some difficult times, we do not have a person who is like that. We have a person who is in prison. And he's writing to a people who are struggling, and he's writing to them out of his understanding of what they're experiencing. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 1 to 11. I'm reading out of the NIV this morning instead of the NLT. Um, there were some <clears throat> interpretations of different words that I think uh, better expressed some of the thoughts that we were going to focus on this morning. So Paul starts off this way. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. And it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But... Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the Apostle Paul, who had uh, incredible revelation by the Spirit and wrote this to the church at Philippi, which speaks to us today. So, Holy Spirit, open our hearts to the word of God. Open our hearts to how you want us to, to receive the word of God in our time, in our season, for our lives, so that we could know Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 
So Paul starts off again, and he says, rejoice. He said, look, I'm going to tell you some things, and it doesn't, it doesn't hurt for me to tell you this over and over and over again. I'm doing it to protect you. I'm doing it to help you. So listen to what I'm telling you, because it's important. Start off by rejoicing. Now, why does he always say rejoice? We can rejoice because we've read the end of the story. Listen, if you're in Jesus, regardless of what you're going through at the time, you know that the ultimate outcome is you win. Is that true? You win. It, the, the end of the story has already been predetermined. You may find yourself in the middle of the story in a very awkward or difficult place, but if you go to the end, you read it, ah, you win. It's done. You're in Jesus. So then he goes on, he says, watch out for those mutilators, those dogs. Basically, he's saying those who minimize the f- sufficiency of the cross. Because here, here's what was going on. In that time, there were Jewish Christians. The, the church was predominantly Jewish Christians, right? And so as these Gentiles were getting saved, coming to Jesus, some of the Jewish Christians were saying, well, you have to be circumcised like we are, or you're not going to be really brought in to the church. And Paul's saying, whatever your condition you're in, whether you're a circumcised Jew or you're an uncircumcised um, Gentile, it doesn't matter. What matters is faith in Jesus and walking with God. So basically what these Jewish believers were trying to tell these non-Jewish believers was that we have superiority and the only way for you to come into the level of camp that we're in is to do what we've done. The cross is not sufficient. And then he goes and calls them dogs. How about that for being kind? You see, Paul is using a little sarcasm here. Because one of the Jewish words for Gentile literally means dog. And so Paul is flipping the script. And then he goes and talks about circumcision, which is the cutting away of a foreskin, and he calls them mutilators. Uh, and Paul's kind of, he's doing some stuff here. And we just read it and go, whatever. No, he's saying, look, if they want to take a knife, go ahead and cut a little further. That's basically what he's saying. You can laugh. I know it's awkward, but it's just what the Bible's teaching. So what does Paul think about this? In Colossians chapter 2, he says this. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision. The cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him, you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ For he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Everything that you had done wrong, Jesus nailed it to his cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers, the authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. The cross is the power of God. It is the place where that that sin nature is crucified with Jesus. Listen, dear ones, don't waste your time debating with people who tell you the special things they do that set them apart as super Christians. You know, if you just follow this teacher, if, if you just focus on this topic, if you just give your attention to this area, if you just believe the way I do, you'd arrive at the spiritual heights that I have. There's really not much that's as ugly as spiritual pride. 
It's really an oxymoron. You, you, you cannot be spiritual and proud just by the very nature of what it is. So really what Paul starts off is he says, okay, you think you guys are, are all that because you're Jews and that you have this upper leg in Jesus. And then he goes on to talk about himself. Look, I was circumcised the eighth day, which means he was his family. He came from a family that was practicing Judaism. He's of the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin was one of the two tribes that stayed faithful to David's line. He says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. He's a, he's a, he speaks the language. He was a Pharisee who we look at him as snakes, but the reality is they were the most religious people of the day. He goes on and says, I was all these things. I had all this spiritual pedigree. So he's identifying himself as all these things, but he says, my identity is different now. I have a totally different identity. So how do you identify yourself when someone asks you about yourself? What do you say? You know, you read these little bios about people. They're kind of funny because you're trying to take however many years of someone's life and put it into four sentences. And it's kind of difficult to do. But typically, when someone wants to know something about you, what's the first thing they ask? What do you do? What do you do? <clears throat> How do we identify ourselves? Well, most of the time it's with our vocation or our roles or our relationships or our hobbies or our dislikes and likes, our values. Those things, many of those things still held true for Paul. He still was a Jew, right? Was Paul still a Jew? Still a Jew. He was still of the tribe of Benjamin. But what he was saying is, I want to be defined differently. I want my identity to be seen through the cross of Jesus Christ. Our culture over the last few years has determined that the primary way we're to identify each human is to discover how they feel about their gender. Regardless of whether they have an X and Y chromosome or two X chromosomes, how they feel determines the core of who they are. Now hear me out. We have spun this thing as a culture to say that the core of who you are is identified based upon how you feel about your gender. The gospel makes it clear that as Christ followers, our identity is not Jew or Gentile, male or female. It is being heirs of God through Jesus Christ. We are his and he is ours. That is our identity. That is our identity. So do we identify with the works of the flesh? Or do we identify with the work done of the spirit? How do you identify? I've not been asked that question yet. Have you? Have y'all gone to the doctor's office and want to know what, how you identify or anything like that? I've not been asked that question yet. I'm sure I'll come up with something fun to say. But I think many of us identify by what we've done. Things that distinguish us. Things that make us proud or things to which we align ourselves. Some may say, I'm a pilot. Another may say, I'm a welder. One may say, I'm a mother. I'm a Democrat. I'm a Republican. I'm an independent. I'm a millionaire. Each of these identifies, identifiers carries weight with a certain group of individuals. How many people in here do we have who really know how to weld? Okay, awesome. I'm impressed. I watched a welder one time and said, nah. You guys could get together and y'all could communicate in ways none of the rest of us could communicate. Agreed? Yeah, I got my TIG and my MIG and my LIG and my SNIG. I got them all going. You, you, they just, they talk in language I don't understand. I don't understand their TIG language. 
but it's, it's based upon what they've done or they have acquired that they identify. These are things with all of us that give us clout, they give us prestige, they give us power in some ways or influence in the world. You know, I, I, do y'all carry much cash in your wallet anymore? I don't. But I, I've got a 50 in here. Does anybody want this 50? Rolf, come up here and get this 50. No, I've got a 50 right here. Come on up, I'll give it to you. It's Monopoly money. Go ahead, brother. It's all yours. Now, I, I want to see how you spend that this week. I want a report of how you spent that money, okay? You see, the things that spend in one arena do not spend in another. And when it comes to our identity, our identity may function in one arena, but it does not function in the other. No matter what we've accomplished... No matter what we can take pride in, that does not spend in the kingdom of God. You cannot cash that in in the kingdom of God. Now, another way we identify ourselves is by what's been done to you. Not just what you've done, but what's been done to you. I'm divorced. I'm the parent of a deceased child. I'm the parent of a disabled child. I'm a cancer survivor. I'm an adult child of an alcoholic. I'm the victim of abuse. I'm a, 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 an abuse survivor. I'm a widow. I'm a widower. I'm a diabetic. All of these things are things that have been imposed upon us. And they may be true about us, but they are not your core identity. Those are not your core identifiers. The way we're to be identified is by what's been done for you. Not what you've done, not what's been done to you, but by what's been done for you. Galatians 6, as for me... May I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because that cross, my interest in the world has been crucified. And the world's interest in me has also died. It doesn't matter whether we've been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we've been transformed into a new creation. God has granted that every one of us who are in Christ are conformed into a new creation. That's his goal for you. His goal for you is transformation. And he's fully capable of doing it. Peter writes this, Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. You have a new identity. And it's not based upon what you've accomplished. It's not based upon what someone has done to you. It is based upon the reality of what Christ has done for you. You have a new identity in Jesus. And this supersedes, trumps every other of the lesser identity identifiers that you have in your life. Dallas Willard says this, and I love this, quote, You are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. That would be worth keeping and reading aloud on a daily basis. Your identity in Christ will come more into view as you let go of the lesser identifiers. So, Paul talks about identity, then he talks about how we're made right with God. Any of you remember reading about um, or hearing about in the Old Testament the scapegoat, what scapegoat was? We use that expression a lot, but it literally comes from the Bible, scapegoat. Now, here's what would happen. On the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, once a year, this, this holy, awesome, dreadful day, all the sins of the people were brought before God. And the high priest would go in and he would cleanse the temple. 
And he'd have one goat, and that blood would be used to cleanse the temple. The second goat was the scapegoat. And what he would do was, when he purified the temple, it says in Leviticus 16, he'd lay both of his hands on the goat's head and confess over it all the wickedness, the rebellion, and the sins of the people of Israel. In this way, he will transfer the people's sins to the head of the goat. Then a man specially chosen for the task will drive the goat into the wilderness. As the goat goes into the wilderness, it will carry all the people's sins upon itself into a desolate land. In the same way, all of our sin was transferred on to Jesus Christ. All of our sin and rebellion was transferred on to him. So righteousness could be then transformed or transferred to us. Now, with the goat, can you imagine? I mean, it, it, it was, this was a sobering day. This was a sobering day. And so uh, the, the high priest places basically all the sins of the people on the goat. And this one dude's responsibility is take it out of the wilderness. And you know, I imagine there were some Jews sitting in their tents that night going, man, I hope that goat doesn't show up at my house. You'd be watching to see if that goat full of sin was coming back to your house. You didn't want that goat to show up. You wanted that goat to go off forever. But the one thing about the goat, the scapegoat could receive the sins of the people, but the scapegoat had no power to place righteousness on the people. It could only take the sin off the people, but not put righteousness on the people. So there could be this, this forgiveness of sin but there could not be this imputation of righteousness. Is this making sense? This is gooder than you know. Hang with me. This is really, really rich. Romans 3 says, everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. So Jesus was the penalty for your sins. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. Can we boast that we've done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith. So what happens is, not only am I acquitted, but now I'm righteous because of Jesus. I'm right with God. I have a new nature, a new ability to honor and to live out a life pleasing to the Lord. And this is so important because it comes back to the issue of identity again. Being identified by the righteousness imparted to me because of what Christ has done frees me to live into that identity. Whereas trying to be righteous when I believe that I'm not yields a life of frustration and failure. We just try and try and try to be good enough and fail and fail and fail. So, <clears throat> there's, there's a teaching that I have subscribed to much of my life that I have believed, and it is, is basically called positional righteousness. In other words, you're not really righteous, but Jesus declares you're righteous, so positionally in Jesus you are righteous. Is that kind of how y'all understand righteousness? That's kind of how I've always, most of my life, understood it. <clears throat> I've come to believe that it's, there's more to it than that. Now, I'm going I'm to go off a little sidetrack here for a minute, and I want you to hang with me. How many of you are familiar with the meta, what the metaverse is? Wow, we're going to be on a learning curve here. Because I, I really am not super familiar with it either. But let me tell you what it is. Facebook has opened up this thing. They changed their name to Meta, and they're starting a metaverse. 
which is different from a scripture verse. A metaverse is this virtual space, okay? They're creating this virtual environment where you can get on a device and you go into this virtual world. And in this virtual world, you can interact with other people who are doing the same thing you're doing. And the way you do that is through an avatar. Y'all know what an avatar is? Any of you have a picture on your phone when you send a text to somebody, it shows something that looks similar to you going like that? That's an avatar. But the avatars are getting a little more complex and complicated and fancy. So you can create an avatar pretty much any way you want to create it. So it can look, say, you, you know, you don't really like your appearance. You want to look like a 21-year-old Asian girl. You can become a 21-year-old Asian girl in the metaverse. Or you could, you know, I could get a six-pack and have a full head of hair and all this in the metaverse. I can be whoever I want to in the metaverse. So, the metaverse is this interactive place. And and let me just give you an example. (laughs) Any of you like coffee shops? Any of you? Okay, in the metaverse, here's what would happen. You would put on your goggles, or you'd look at your phone, or you'd get on your computer, and you'd do your little avatar, and you'd chink, 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 and you'd go into this really cool, fancy little um, coffee shop that you love. And there would be other people from all over the world in that little coffee shop interacting with you. And you'd be sitting at home in your PJs with your hair like this, but man, you'd look amazing in your avatar, and you'd be sucking on your own coffee that you made. Making sense? Is it making sense? Okay. So, the avatar, again, can look like almost anything you can imagine it to be. Now, I'm going to digress again. I'm digressing off my digression. (laughs) When I was raising my kids, I was worried about music, about uh, TV shows, about movies, about whether Pokemon was demonic. (laughs) Um, Parents now have to be worried about avatars in the metaverse. I'm sorry for you, parents. I, I mean it. But I will tell you that we have someone on our staff who sends out a newsletter to parents constantly, and it has incredible information. And if you don't open it and look at it, shame on you. I'm not a shame person, but I'm going to shame you right now. Eric puts a lot of work into getting you information to help you know what's going on in your teen's life. Open the thing and read it. it listen. Your kids are going to be sucked into stuff that you don't even know what it means. You've got to do some research. All right, that was my tirade on the side. So, back to the metaverse. So, in this understanding, you put a depiction of yourself out there while the true you is not nearly as glamorous or interesting or attractive Our righteousness is not like a virtual avatar, only a representation, something that's never fully realized. Our righteousness is now perfect in Christ, though not yet perfect in us. It's this already not yet that we've talked about in the kingdom of God. Our life is hidden with Christ and God, not only positionally, but genuinely, yet it's still hidden. It's hidden. It's there. It's like a seed. You plant a seed in the ground. Is that seed have everything in it? It needs to be an oak tree. Yes, it's just hidden. In you is the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus that is as real now as it will be when you're in heaven. George Hunsinger says this, His death is their death, his life is their life, and his righteousness is their righteousness. What the faithful are in themselves is transitory. 
while what they are is imperishable. What, sorry. What the faithful are in themselves is transitory, while what they are in Christ is imperishable. What they are in him is real, hidden, and yet to come. All right, now I'm going to bounce back to something. I was talking about Eric and the youth. Let me, let me just tell you that if your kid or your grandkid or whatever is not involved in the youth group, um, I would just tell you, Eric and our volunteers, we've got some amazing people loving on the kids, and we've got some remarkable young people in our church. And you may say, well, my kid doesn't want to go. I, look, I understand that, but there was a time your kid didn't want to take a bath. And your kid doesn't usually want to clean his room. Now, I'm not saying you force kids to like church. What I'm telling you is be a leader, be their parent, and say, look, you're going to go three times, and you're going to see how it is. And if you don't want to go after that, fine. But encourage them to go three times. Let me tell you about some of the quality of some of the kids we have here. Wow, I'm all over the place, but this is good stuff. Um, James Carden, Carter, Aiden Clark, Sophia Clark. Ainsley Clark, Zoe Perry, are y'all all here? Y'all stand up. Wow, and you're all sitting together. That's cool. Didn't plan that. Okay, yeah, you're clapping. You don't even know why. Listen, these young people, they, they, I'm going to get some of this wrong, so y'all can correct me later. They are on a team that built at school, they built an electric car, okay? Okay. And they competed with all these other schools, and they got first place, all right? Now, the person who put on this, their benefactor who put on this, this promotion, this competition, invited them to go compete in the United Arab Emirates. Yes. And you know how many schools got invited? Three. Three. In the country. Yeah. So now you're going, I'm not sending my kid over there. Those kids are smart and my kid's dumb. <laughs> Listen, let me, let me just tell you about these kids. When you go, oh, I don't know what's happening with the kids of the future. I don't. The school board said, look, the United Arab Emirates, we don't know that it's safe, so you can't go. And they're going, well, this guy's going to pay for us to go. Well, you can't go. So the guy who tries to work something out where they can go over spring break. And the school board says, yeah, but the car is ours, so you can't take it. And what it is, they're worried about the kids' safety. Okay? That's what it is. But all the parents are like, they're our kids. We take responsibility. So what do the kids do? They egged every one of the houses of the school board members. <laughs> yeah, they're amazing kids. They did not do that. They did not do that. They went to the school board meeting, and they all stood up and read position papers on why they should go. Look at these kids, man. They rock. Y'all are awesome. Told you I was all over the place, but it'd be worth it. All right. Now, y'all, listen, y'all might want to get their autographs. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, I knew him when. All right. So Paul says, I want to participate in Christ's suffering. I, that, that concept is strange. What does he mean? He wants to participate in Christ's sufferings and become like him in his death. What does he mean? And why in the world would anyone desire that? In Acts chapter 9, there's a story where the Lord intersects Paul. Paul is on his way to Damascus to go persecute the church. And Paul's going along, and a light from heaven comes and knocks him down. He falls to the ground, and he hears a voice saying, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? He says, who are you, Lord? The voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now, question for you. Was Paul 
literally persecuting the person of Jesus? He was persecuting Jesus' body. He was persecuting Jesus by persecuting Jesus' body, the ones whom Jesus loved. Jesus said, when you do it to the least of these, my brethren, you do it to me. How do we enter into the sufferings of Jesus? We enter into the sufferings of his body. We enter into the wounds of his body. Any of you ever had a child who was really, really, really sick? Or gone through something really horrible? It's, it's like you, you feel it to such a degree that you can't even express it. You would take it on yourself if you could. That's how you enter, enter into the sufferings of Jesus. It is that we participate in Christ's sufferings when we come alongside those whom he loves that are suffering. When we share the pain of another, we come to know them in a very unique way. In a deep way. There are some people I know in this church in ways that most of you never will because I've walked with them through very deep, painful situations. And it does something to connect you. And when you do that with someone, you're doing it to Jesus. You are entering into the sufferings of Jesus. If you want to know him, if you want to gain him, if you want to be found in him, this will come as you enter into participating of the wounds in his body. We know Christ more deeply this way. I'm going I'm to pick on somebody. He's not here. So um, David Gibson. You all know David. David is suffering with chronic pain that doctors cannot, in, in almost all of his joints. Um, and, and they've, there's, there's, He's gone to so many doctors. He's gone to so many different things. And David's pain is, is just virtually unbearable. And, you know, my heart just breaks for him. But it, when somebody's in that kind of situation, honestly, you just you kind of want to run from him. Don't look at me like that. I haven't run from him. I'm telling you, you want to get away because you don't know anything you can do or say. Come on, am I right? You come near them and you're like... They're dealing with so much pain, and so I got nothing. I got nothing. I can't, I, I don't have the faith to pray for them, or I can't heal them, or I, I don't know how to tell them, oh, it's going to be all better. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't. How do you enter into David's suffering? When you enter into David's suffering, you enter into Jesus' suffering. David's just one man in our church. The way you enter into David's suffering is by you go and you sit with David, you just be his friend. Sorry, David, if he's watching. Share each other's burdens, and in this way you obey the law of Christ. And this is something for all of us to remember. What we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed to us later. We enter into the sufferings of Jesus when we keep in mind the resurrection of Christ and the coming glory to be revealed. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And then the last thing he says, he says, I want to know his resurrection, which is coming. But he says, I want to be conformed to his death. I want to be conformed into the likeness of his death. Jesus said, if you try to hang on to your life, you're going to lose it. But if you give it up for my sake, you'll find it. This is like the guy with the one talent in the story of the talents. He buried it. He hid it out of fear. And, and he's, he's told, you wicked servant, I, I gave this to you and you didn't even put it to work. It's kind of like this. Let's say you decide to buy stock in a company and you take everything you own and you put it in that stock. I mean everything. You've, you've put everything in that stock. Now your money is under the care and the oversight of that company to expand their business. And thus you've relinquished control of that money. It's yours, but it is dead to you in the sense that you cannot access it apart from going through that company in which you invested it. Whether you realize or a loss or a gain is contingent upon several factors, supply, demand, the management of the company, whether the government is making foolish decisions, 
what you will realize becomes clear over time. And this is what it is like for us to be conformed to the likeness of Christ's death. We take our life, our daily life, and we invest it into the kingdom of God. Then through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we begin to receive eternal dividends from God here and now. And those dividends we receive from God are put into his service to expand the purposes of Jesus in the universe. The full return will be realized at the resurrection. Christ's death was the ultimate act of self-sacrificing love. And we have small opportunities, countless times every day, to be conformed to his death. We are conformed to his death each time we choose self-sacrificing love over self-preservation or self-indulgence. This is the place of being led by the Spirit because the Spirit needs to lead us in doing this. As we go into communion and receive this gift this morning, we are ingesting his life and thus, his life of self-sacrificing love nourishes us and then flows through us. This is how we're identified, dear ones. This is our identification with Jesus. Almighty God, we thank you for the gifts of this wafer and this juice. And we ask that they would be unto us the body, the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we give thanks. Conform us in Jesus' name. We're going to continue to worship the Lord. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. Prayer teams, if you go ahead and come up by the, uh, the purple walls over here. <clears throat> this is a time to allow the words that God has spoken to your heart to begin to percolate begin to respond to God in worship, and also to receive prayer. Some of you need to be freed this morning from a false identity. You, you just, uh, you've identified with something that's happened to you from the past, and that has defined you, and God wants to break that off of you so your identity can be in Jesus. Some of you have identified as you always have to be the strong one. You always have to. Listen, Jesus is the strong one. You're the, you're the child. He's the Savior. Some of you need prayer to understand what it means that you are now righteous in him. It doesn't mean you're just forgiven. It means that he's granted you his life so that you can live a life that's honoring to him. You need to see how God sees you, how God loves you. Others of you may be going through a time of suffering right now and you need someone to pray with you. You may need physical or emotional healing. We'll anoint you with oil this morning. Any other burden that you're carrying, just come and let these folks pray with you this morning and respond to the Lord. The rest of us, let's stand and worship God. Sing with all your heart to the Lord. Respond to him with gladness.
worship you. I worship you.
made a way for all of us. He's, he's grafted us in. He's done more than we know. He loves you with an everlasting love. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Nothing can ever separate you from the love of God that's found in Jesus Christ. Before I dismiss you, I want to sing happy birthday to Sarah Lena. Sarah is 31 today. You ready? <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sarah. Happy birthday to you. Woo! Oh, hallelujah. Man, what an awesome day. Amen? Mm -mm -mm. Lord, bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. Lord, give you his peace. God bless you, dear ones. Walk close to Jesus this week.